Hello everybody, it's Ian here once again from OUFC Fan View, and it's back to do part three of this season review. It's the final chapter, it's the final leg of Oxford United's promotion winning season of 2023-2024. We continue to look back at the highs, the lows, the anger and the joy from Liam Manning to Des Buckingham. We last left our heroes in the middle of March. Oxford's season had been staggering and stumbling and that 5-0 defeat to Bolton seemed like the final knockout blow. Each chapter of this story ends with a game against Bolton so to continue to compare this to the original Star Wars trilogy we're entering into the return of the Jedi phase. Obviously if you haven't watched part one and part two I do suggest that you go back and watch those you can see them on the channel part two is linked above at this stage of the season united were broken and beaten and they'd slipped to eighth in the sky bet league one table there seemed like there was no coming back from this and somehow buckingham had to pick his side up off the canvas scarlet is once again going to read out the game so please come and join me as we embark on what will be a wonderful end to the season and a fitting place to start is the Wembley of the North as we're heading to Port Vale. Skybet League One, Game 39, 16th of March 2024, Port Vale nil, Oxford United 2. Not surprisingly, there were changes from that game at Bolton. Will Goodwin started up front and Oxford unveiled the fabled 4-1-4-1 formation for the first time. When I first saw the formation, it was a little bit surprising and seeing Brannigan as the only holding midfield player looked a bit strange to me, but it also looked like it was going to give license for Oxford to attack and get forward and get a lot of attacking players in the box. You have to also think that the fixture list was quite kind to Oxford here because Port Vale were in total free fall at this stage of the season and ended up being perfect opposition. Oxford got a goal early when Kieran Brown scored a really scrappy goal from a corner and the U's played with a renewed fire in the belly but once again that second goal just did not come in the first half. But then it did come early in the second half as Josh Murphy scored a cross come shot which is probably being a bit harsh to Murphs, but you can judge for yourselves. And from that point on, Oxford never looked like losing. This was a win that Oxford desperately needed. It was solid, it was professional, and it helped to get some of that Bolton 5-0 taste out of the mouth. There was an international break after this game, so it gave Oxford a bit of time to still work on formation and tactics. But there is a couple of things I just want to update you with, with players that we never saw again. Will Goodwin got injured in that Port Vale game, and despite it only being a minor injury, we never saw him again for the rest of the season. He kept being one of those, oh, he's close, he's close, he's close, but we never saw him again. There's still a lot of question marks remaining over Will Goodwin, and it'll be interesting to see what sort of a role he can play in the championship. And it's not his fault that Oxford paid 400 grand for him, but the fans are going to want to see some return on investment. That was also the end for Jay Matete. I actually forgot what game he got injured in, but regrettably we never saw the best of Matete. And also it, it's come to light now that we ended up getting a transfer, or suspended, sorry, transfer embargo uh, because of not paying Sunderland on time for his services. But he went back to Sunderland before the end of the season, and from his point of view, he's a great player, and I just hope he can get over his injury problems. And that was also the end for Tyler Bure, and he will join the likes of Sonny Perkins, Atif Kanate, Tyler Smith on pointless as pointless answers for players that played for Oxford United. It was a strange one really because I actually thought he was quite decent in the limited times we saw him, but there was clearly something about him that Buckingham didn't like, and we never saw him again. Sky Bet League One, Game 40, 29th of March 2024, Shrewsbury Town 1, Oxford United 1. So the international break was over and Oxford entered the Easter period and were looking to see if they could build on that win against Port Vale. And in some ways they did, but in some ways it felt like the same old, same old. Sometimes your opponents don't help and the Shrews 
are a really dull side. They don't score many goals, but they don't concede many goals either. So when Billy Bowden gave United the lead early in the second half, you kind of thought that was job done. But the broken record is sounding once again, and frustratingly, Oxford didn't kick on and get that second goal, and they invited Shrewsbury pressure. And whilst they didn't necessarily look like getting an equaliser, Oxford's inability to hold on to a lead was in full evidence once again. United just couldn't clear their lines and it came out to the edge of the box. Decent shot by the Shrewsbury man, but it was a shot that JB Cumming really should have saved, but he only managed to palm it into the bottom corner. Like when Oxford played Cheltenham a few weeks ago, the equalising goal spurred Oxford into life and all of a sudden they came out of the traps and they were laying siege to the Shrewsbury goal. But unlike that Cheltenham game, they just couldn't find the winner. But my goodness, there were some close calls and some goal mouth strambles that just didn't go our way. So you couldn't help feeling very frustrated that we didn't take three points from this one because every time at this stage we didn't take three points, it just felt like the playoffs were slipping away. And once again, Oxford were just guilty of being passive when they were in the lead. So we did reach the end of March and I've been doing pros and cons for every month. This month is obviously split up over two videos, so let's go over what the pros were. So you had this emergence of a new style of 4-1-4-1 after the Bolton game and that was certainly a refreshing sight to see Oxford looking more attacking. If you think back to the start of the, of the month, Oxford actually put in a very decent performance against Portsmouth despite the defeat. Murphy and Dale were excellent in this month and they certainly looked like they were enjoying the new formation in the last two games as well, giving them so much more license to get forward, hugging the touchline and causing problems. I've got to give the club's higher ups praise for that fans forum that they did at the start of the month because that did clear the air with the fans. I think that, uh, I know the Bolton game soured everyone again, but that did give everyone a renewed sense of confidence that things were okay off the field and it certainly helped the fans get behind the team on the field. So let's have a look at these cons, and the obvious one is Bolton. Bolton Wanderers' game was one of the worst performances and results I've ever seen Oxford have, so it is clearly going to be number one here. Oxford dropped down to seventh in the league and were overtaken by a resurgent Lincoln City. They still look like that lack of cutting edge and just that lack of clinicalness. Is that a word? It is a word now, when Oxford were winning games. Jamie Cumming was starting to look a little dodgy in goal. He was starting to have a little bit of the Simon Eastwood struggling to get down to save shots into the corners. And you saw some goals against Bolton, Cheltenham and against Shrewsbury. You felt he should have saved. And the injuries to Goodwin and Matete that I referenced earlier did look like they were going to hamper Oxford United. We didn't look like we had a huge amount of depth up front or in midfield, certainly not up front. And uh, it was putting a lot of pressure on Mark Harris. And it kind of really summed up the January transfer window, which was a little bit underwhelming as opposed to the window that we had in August. But let's put March in the rear view mirror and let's start looking towards a much more favourable April this was the final month of the regular season and at this point at the start of April it did feel like promotion was a long shot. And at this stage as well, even if Oxford did find themselves in the playoffs, you felt the chances of winning them would be very slim. There were some tough looking fixtures that stood in Oxford's way, certainly towards the end of the month. But the start of the month, we saw two very winnable games starting on April Fool's Day. Sky Bet League One, Game 41, 1st of April 2024, Oxford United 4, Fleetwood Town 0. Suddenly the draw with Shrewsbury on Good Friday didn't seem so bad because on Easter Monday the U's racked up a big home win against a Fleetwood side that I have to say was destined for the drop. But this game did have its sliding doors moment because at the start of the game, the Cod Army had a glorious chance to take the lead in this one. Fleetwood's Lonergan was clean through. The pole of the Kassam Stadium held its breath and he just put his effort wide. I really feared what the mood in the Kassam Stadium would have been like if that would have gone in. But Oxford Lux seemed like it was in this day because after that chance went begging, a heavily deflected Brannigan effort made it 1-0 to United. And the Yellows never really looked back after that. And for once... They killed the game off in the first half. Harris and Dale made it 3-0 before half-time. And then another heavily deflected effort from Sparky made it 4-0 just before the end. You have to highlight Murphy and Dale again because at times they were unplayable. But this was also the first time that Des Buckingham used Tyler Goodrum in a central midfield role. And like most things that Goodrum does, he flourished. 
This was a big win and it was a confidence boosting win to start the month. Skybet League One, game 42, 6th of April 2024, Burton Albion nil, Oxford United 4. United made it back to back 4 0 wins with a thumping win over another side that was struggling down the foot of the table. It was a sorry performance by Burton Albion, and Oxford looked to class above the Brewers all day long. Mark Harris, in particular, was superb, and it was Harris who opened the scoring by racing clear after the Burton backline made a mistake. Look, it was the sort of chance that Harris was missing earlier on in the season, certainly in the first half of the season, and it shows what a different man he is since Buckingham took over because he rounded ex-United keeper Max Crocombe and stuck it in the back of the net with ease. It was only 1-0 at half-time, but for once Oxford didn't sit back on a half-time 1-0 lead and continued to look threatening in the second half. Murphy teed up Harris for a tap-in to make it 2-0 and then Murphy pretty much ran the length of the Burton pitch to make it 3-0. James Henry scored a late fourth. It was an elegant finish and fitting that this would be his last goal for the U's. But there were a couple of negatives on the injury front. Cameron Brannigan went off in the first half and was seen in a protective boot after the game. Elliot Moore was also struggling at the end of the game with a hip problem. These were certainly worries, but this was still a fine win for Oxford United. And to make things better, it put United back in the playoffs. Because we can't have nice things and enjoy them, much of the chatter after this game was about how poor the opposition has been rather than how good Oxford have been. And I must admit, I didn't think the 4-1-4-1 formation would work against the better sides, but we were about to find out. Oxford had three home games up on Saturday, Tuesday and Friday, all against promotion rivals in Peterborough, Lincoln and Stevenage. The toughest of these games looked like it was going to be Peterborough and the posh were up next. Sky Bet League 1, Game 43, 13th of April 2024. Oxford United 5, Peterborough United 0. So I'm recording this audio on a sunny but chilly day in July, which makes me think about this gloriously sunny, warm day in April, and it seems like a lifetime ago. Context before this game, Peterborough was still pushing for an automatic promotion place at this point of the season, but they were coming off the back of a successful but tough week. Posh won the EFL Trophy over Wickham on the Sunday, and then they played on the Wednesday against Port Vale. That Port Vale game wasn't particularly difficult, but it was still another game in a short space of time. Oxford themselves had a free week to prepare for it, but were without Brannigan and without Elliot Moore. So Oxford needed the Oxford old boys to step in. Sam Long and Josh McEachran stepped into Brannigan and Moore's shoes, and both of them were excellent. This game can be quickly forgotten with what happened over Bolton at Wembley, but this was a real carnival atmosphere, and both sides were looking dangerous in the opening stages. Oxford's pressing was different class in this game, and the U's won so many turnovers in midfield and forced mistakes time and time again, and like what they did against Burton and Fleetwood, they were clinical in front of goal. Mark Harris made it five goals from three games. My goodness, still have to say, what a turnaround this guy had in 2024 as he scored from the spot, taking over Cameron, Cameron Brannigan's responsibilities, but he didn't miss. And then there was a howler from Peterborough goalkeeper Steer playing out from the back. He just allowed Murphy to head the ball into the empty net to make it 2-0. I do just have to mention one thing as well, because just after Oxford took the lead in this game, Posh's Ricky J. Jones hit the crossbar from about two yards. You really sensed it was going to be Oxford's day at that point. And the yellows were hitting Posh on the counter-attack time and time again. Murphy once again was a class apart, and he set up Rodriguez for number three. And this goal won't get talked about much at the end of the season, but it is an extremely classy team goal. Oxford should have led by more at the break, but still at 3-0... It was fantastic, but you were still wary of a Peterborough fight back. And Peterborough had pressure and created chances. But Oxford's determination to defend and keep a clean sheet was, for me, just as impressive as our attacking play. There seemed to be a newfound steal within the Oxford United players to keep that ball out of the net. And my goodness, was it blooming refreshing to see. Oxford got two more goals in the second half and they were two more brilliant goals as well. Rodriguez got on the end of a wonderful Stevens cross to power in a diving header and then Billy Bowden upstaged everybody with this deft finish. This might be the goal of the season. I'll let you decide. 
when we get towards the Bolton game, and I'll talk about that game being spoilers, obviously, talk about that game being one of the best performances I've ever seen Oxford United have. But this Peterborough game is certainly up there as well. This was an amazing performance against a side that had destroyed us at London Road earlier on in the season. To make things better, results went Oxford's way elsewhere and United were in sixth place with a three-point gap to Blackpool and a five-point gap to Lincoln. This felt like such a statement win. With the likes of Brannigan and Moore out as well, it felt even better. More and more fans were getting behind Buckingham and getting on the Oxford United bandwagon. And at this point of the season, I thought the playoffs were a done deal. However, I am always a sweet summer child and football has a habit of kicking you in the plums. Sky Bet League One, Game 44, 16th of April 2024. Oxford United nil, Lincoln City one. Oh dear, surely all Oxford had to do was avoid defeat and they would be in the playoffs. But Michael Scabala's imps were certainly no pushovers and they came to the Kassam for a smash and grab win. Oxford dominated the ball, but they struggled to break down a well-organised Lincoln City side. Both sides missed chances in the first half, but it was Lincoln who took the opportunity at the start of the second half. It was a slightly lucky penalty well I think a very lucky penalty that went Lincoln's way but they took advantage of it and they went 1-0 up from that point on the imps defended expertly and they shut United out you couldn't help but be a bit disappointed with the lack of shots on goal that Oxford created they just really just could not prize this Lincoln defense open and they rarely troubled the Lincoln goalkeeper so Lincoln stole the points and they celebrated it like it was they got over the line and got in the playoffs. But they certainly had kept that playoff dream alive. So you can't really blame them for celebrating. And this just ramped up the pressure on Oxford's next home game. Sky Bet League 1, Game 45, 19th of April 2024. Oxford United 1, Stevenage 1. There were just two days rest from the Lincoln game because Sky TV wanted to show this game live and that meant that they moved it from Saturday to the Friday. I couldn't help but be worried that this might affect Oxford's players in terms of them being very fatigued. But Stevenage's playoff push did feel like it had fizzled out at this point and Steve Evans actually jumped ship before this game back to Rotherham. But during this game you just felt like the hands of fate were conspiring against Oxford United. Marcus Brown was denied a stone wall penalty. Honestly, how is that not given? And then Stevenage took the lead through a three cone goal which was pretty much their only attack of the game. To be fair, Oxford's luck did turn in the second half and they were fortunate to get a penalty in the second half and Brannigan, as always, was the man to tuck it away. And unlike the Tuesday night game against Lincoln, Oxford really pushed hard for the winner, but it just wouldn't come. So that left Oxford in a horrible position, really. We had to hope and pray that results would go our way on the Saturday, and they mostly didn't. Lincoln beat Cheltenham to jump above United on goal difference, and Blackpool were in the mix too after a 3-2 win over Barnsley. This actually was quite bad for Barnsley and the Tykes form had fallen off a cliff at this point, which meant there were four teams vying for two playoff places on the final weekend. Here are the fixtures and Oxford arguably had the toughest one of all of them as they faced a trip to Exeter. All United could do was win this game to give themselves a chance. Many people thought that it was season over and they weren't even going to watch this game and just check the result later on. They didn't want to get their hopes up and I totally understand it. There was a realistic chance that Oxford could finish 7th this season and miss out on goal difference. Sky Bet League 1, Game 46, 27th of April 2024. Exeter City 1, Oxford United 2. So this is what the end of the season is supposed to be all about. A number of teams vying for a number of things. You're concentrating on your own game. You're also concentrating on all the other games that are going on around League One as well. Apart from the first five to ten minutes of the first half, Oxford were superb. They were putting Exeter under pressure and exploiting their mistakes. Mark Harris raced clear to make it 1-0 after 12 minutes. This was Harris's last goal of the season and he finished agonisingly on 19 goals. Worth mentioning again that he was much maligned during in the first half of the season and what an indispensable part of the team that he became. It's not just his goals, his work rate is fantastic and if you go back and watch all of Oxford's goals this season, Mark Harris is involved in a very high percentage of them. But back to this game and Brannigan made it 2-0 from the penalty spot, no surprises there, and Oxford was so dominant 
that attention did turn to Oxford scoring enough goals to overturn Lincoln's goal difference. Things were getting a little bit silly. It's the last game of the season, but things were going to plan at half time because Oxford were winning, Lincoln were drawing with Portsmouth, and at this point, the U's were in the playoffs. But this second half was torture. Sitting around waiting for the scores from elsewhere is bad enough, but Oxford were also put under severe pressure from Exeter City. The Grecians had been the form side in League One going into this one, and they really made Oxford sweat. There was news of Lincoln missing a penalty, and that came seconds before Exeter got it back to 2-1. After this, though, Oxford defended superbly. Moore and Brown, Stevens and Bennett were rock solid at the back, but the whole side put their bodies on the line to get Oxford this much needed win. News came in from around the ground and it was only getting better and better for the Yellows, but it certainly made this game more and more tense to watch. Eventually, the final whistles blew around the country. Portsmouth, John Massino, you bloody legend, beat Lincoln. Barnsley conceded a late equaliser to Northampton. And all this meant that Oxford had done it. The U's had done it. And we even managed to finish in fifth place as well. Put it into context, dead and buried a month ago, this alone marked a wonderful achievement for Des Buckingham, who increasingly was looking more and more at home and comfortable in the Oxford United dugout. Oxford were the only side to win out of all the playoff chasers on the final day. This game will be overlooked, but United handled the pressure unbelievably well. When the pressure couldn't be more tense, this was a very clutch victory. And that was the end of April. And my goodness, look how different the pros and cons are looking now. United secured a fifth place finish in the league. If you'd have given us that at the start of the season, we would have bitten your hand off. So job done. The win against Peterborough was at the time as good a win as I can remember Oxford United having. Certainly for a long, long time. Goodrum was looking fantastic in his new midfield role. He was snappy, getting about players, winning the ball back and getting Oxford breaking on the opposition. And Oxford, above all else, were defending solidly as a team. And clean sheets started to happen too, which was whew, very, very good to see. And Des Buckingham looked like a new man. He really did. There's no other way to say it. And the fans were warming to him and everything was looking good for Oxford United. The only con is still that ability to break down a side like a Lincoln City who sit very deep and defend. They also struggled a bit against Stevenage. But Lincoln are a very unique side in the way they defend. I don't think there's many better sides at defending than Lincoln. And I actually thought if Lincoln would have got in the playoffs, they would have had a decent chance of winning them. So Oxford United season is extended on. We're into the playoffs. It's time for May. So Oxford were up against Peterborough United in a two-legged semi-final, a side that we had just beaten 5-0 at the start of April. There was a sense amongst Oxford fans, myself included, that we were happy to be there and that it didn't really feel like there was any pressure on the yellows going into this first leg. It was a beautiful Saturday evening at a sold out Kassam Stadium and you kind of sensed it would be a special night. Sky Bet League One. Playoff semi-final first leg 4th of May 2024. Oxford United won. Peterborough United nil. Before we talk about matters on the pitch, Oxford fans and Oxford staff did a remarkable job of creating an atmosphere for this game. Posh fans, you packed out the away end and they were in fine voice as well. And the Kassam Stadium for once actually looked quite the picture. On the field, this game was tight. And whilst Oxford controlled the first half in terms of possession, chances were at a premium. Peterborough was strangely cautious and it was almost like Darren Ferguson was worried about being too expansive after the last time the sides met. There was only one goal to separate the sides and this goal came early in the second half. It was a Josh Murphy corner headed back across goal by Cameron Brannigan and up jumped the skipper Elliot Moore to make it 1-0. The stadium erupted into jubilation. Elliot Moore's celebration was immense but the game was not done. And the realisation sunk in now, and I was nervous for the first time. Oxford now had something to lose. And Peterborough was stung into action, and they forced the pace for the remainder of this game. And despite their pressure, Oxford once again stood firm and ensured they took the slenderest of leads to London Road 
for the second leg. I still considered Peterborough to be favourites going into this second leg. Their home form had been very strong throughout the season and there were a lot of posh fans in my comments that were very bullish that Peterborough would turn this around. Some even thought it would be a formality and they would blow Oxford away. One thing was for sure, this was going to be a brutally tough game. Sky Bet League One. Playoff semi-final, second leg, 8th of May 2024, Peterborough United 1, Oxford United 1. Oxford United win the tie 2-1 on aggregate. And boy oh boy was this game something, London Road was packed to the rafters and the Peterborough faithful were doing all they could to make it hostile for the U's. Their side responded and Peterborough picked up from where they left off at the end of the first leg and pretty much dominated Oxford for the entire game. It was very worrying because Oxford could hardly mount any attacks or really keep the ball for any significant periods and it became a case of the Yellows just trying to repel wave after wave of Peterborough attack. But like what we've seen in recent weeks though, Oxford were defending very well and coming, was coming, see what I did there, to the rescue when United needed it. But it certainly was horrible to watch and towards the end of the first half you just sensed there were a few cracks in the Oxford United defence opening up. Finn Stevens gave away a rash free kick and from that Josh Knight steered it beyond Jamie Cumming and the tie was level. Peterborough fans were buoyant to the point where there was a flare thrown onto the pitch. This delayed the kickoff and it visibly irked the Peterborough players who sensed blood and they wanted to get on with the game. Now, did this turn things in Oxford United's favour? There were people who were adamant that it did. I don't know. I'll let you make your own minds up about it. I just thought I would bring it up. But for whatever reason, Posh was sloppy for the next few minutes after the restart. They gave Oxford a small foothold and succeeded a tiny bit of pressure and Oxford took advantage. Owen Dale won a free kick right on the edge of the box and it was powered towards goal by Brannigan but the Peterborough skipper Burrows put his hand up in the air and the referee gave the penalty. I'm usually pretty good at watching penalties but this was one that I really struggled to watch. But why would I ever doubt Cameron Brannigan? He has ice in his veins and he was ice cold once again to roll the ball home and Oxford were back ahead in the tie. So 1-1 at half time, but you knew this was gonna be a long second half with Oxford having to soak up buckets of pressure. If the used defense was cracking though, Buckingham did a terrific patch up job and that worked wonders. Sam Long came on for Finn Stevens and the Bister boy put in a heroic second half. This was actually the last we saw of Finn Stevens, and I just wanted to acknowledge what a wonderful season the young man had. Talented going forward, but I think there was a real maturity in the defensive side of his game in the last few weeks of the season. Thank you very much for the memories, Finn, and good luck with the rest of your career. So the second half was as predicted, with Peterborough on the front foot for the majority of it. However, the more and more the half went on, the more and more you sense that they were getting sloppy and starting to panic. They weren't testing Jamie Cumming, and the more the minutes ticked by, the more you started to think it was going to be Oxford's day. Marcus McGuane, who was superb when he came on early in the game for Tyler Goodrum, had the chance to wrap it up, but his shot went just wide. Inevitably, though, there was a late flurry of chances. Sam Long cleared an effort off the line. My goodness, what a great clearance that was. And then Jamie Cumming made that save. You've all seen it. Here's a picture of it. There's the highlights of it as well to deny a second goal for Knight. And then there was one final ball into the box, which saw the ball bounce agonizingly across the six yard line. And there was nobody there to prod it home. The referee blew the whistle and Oxford had done it. If you're gonna win promotion, you need to go through the ringer and this is what this game was. This game was draining. For Oxford to get through in the manner they did felt a little bit surreal. Neutrals or posh fans may look at the game and think they were unlucky and they have an argument they certainly might be right in that case. On another day, Peterborough would have won this tie. But the grit and the determination put in by the Oxford players cannot be understated. There was the resolve that quite simply has not been there for quite a while. It's hard to single out anyone, but Elliot Moore and Kieran Brown were like two towering colossi. The way the Oxford United players scrapped tooth and nail to get through will never be forgotten by me. This was a night to be proud, Oxford United fans, and Oxford United were going to Wembley 
and Oxford United were one game from promotion. So who stood in our way? Well, we all know who it was, wasn't it? Oh, it would be Oxford United versus Bolton Wanderers in the playoff final at Wembley. The side that humiliated Oxford a few short weeks ago. Despite that, the mood amongst Oxford fans in the build-up to this felt very relaxed. The media work from the club did a wonderful job of banging the Oxford United drum and tickets were selling fast. Oxford were the underdogs, but the pressure was all on Bolton. And whilst the U's certainly weren't going to turn up to Wembley, and just be happy to be there losing in the final would be no disgrace and United seemed like they were in a good place even if we didn't go up for a two horse race though it did feel like Oxford weren't given much of a chance from my point of view living and working in Sheffield I was being asked by my colleagues one if I'm going to the final and that was soon followed up by statement number two I don't think you have much chance and that was fine by me I was happy with Oxford being underestimated I was happy with us being the underdogs I doubt the Bolton media and the majority of their fans thought it would be easy but from the neutrals point of view and from the media point of view there only seemed like there was going to be one winner But what gave me cause for optimism was the way that Buckingham and the players spoke about this final. They were determined to seize the opportunity and they certainly weren't just going to go there to make the numbers up. There was the quote banging around of we haven't come this far to only come this far which is such a Jim Smith comment it's not even funny. But I couldn't get away from the fact that Bolton had routed Oxford 5-0 a few weeks ago and that was such a humiliating defeat to the point where Oxford just couldn't get out of their half. They had no control of the game that day and we'd also just seen a second leg against Peterborough where a similar thing happened and Oxford only just got over the line. I kept thinking that if the Trotters were allowed to dictate terms I just couldn't see Oxford getting the win. On a side note though, I've been there the last three times Oxford have won promotion, so that has to be a good omen, right? 1996, 2010 and 2016. Look at these beautiful chaps in 2016. No, no, not the Oxford players, these beautiful chaps. If you're only listening to the audio of this, that gag's really not going to work. But laugh along anyway, it'll make you feel better. Sky Bet League One, playoff final, 18th of May 2024, Bolton Wanderers nil. Oxford United too. Here it is then folks, look, I'm going to start this by saying this was a perfect day and I know that sounds a bit lame but I generally can't think of many better days supporting Oxford United. I wasn't there for the Milk Cup win so for me this was as good as I've ever seen it. I will explain more of what I mean by that at the end. So the worst thing about the day was being squeezed in on the train up to Wembley like a sardine. And if that's the worst thing about your day, it really is nothing to complain about. But seriously, how do people travel like that every day? And who would ever live in London? There was a Scouse bloke on the train. He was supporting Oxford. Uh, they were kind of like a second team for him. And I remember him speaking to other people on the train and he was very bullish in all of his opinions about football. But he was also adamant in saying, Oxford would beat Bolton that day and I remember thinking number one he's talking way too much and number two this is madness how could he be so confident but you know what he was bloody right both sets of supporters made their clubs proud with over 30,000 fans from each side making it a very special atmosphere but the game itself was quite scrappy for the first 30 minutes. That's not unusual for finals so you kind of expected it. It needed something to ignite it and that spark was provided by Josh Murphy. Like a lot of Oxford's attacking players, Murphs had been quite quiet up to this point, but he cut inside and fired Oxford into the lead. The shot deflected off a Bolton defender, Santos, and caused it to loop over the keeper. But who cares about that? 10 minutes later, it was 2-0. Ruben Rodriguez made this goal. He showed the vision of a hawk and the skill of a hawk. Yeah, that'll do. To find Murphy galloping through on goal, Murphy rounded Baxter and had the composure to slot home. To quote Jerome Sale in 2010, That is what you call dreamland! 2-0 up at half-time and Bolton were booed off. Realisation started to kick in that we were 45 minutes from the championship. It just didn't feel real. Surely something was going to go wrong at some stage. Where was Ryan Clark to drop a routine cross into the net? Bolton had pressure at the start of the second half, but they just 
weren't creating chances. Oxford once again were rock solid in defence and you sense that the Whites were getting frustrated and were running out of ideas. The battle was being won by United, especially in midfield, and it was Oxford who looked more likely of getting a third goal on the break. Even when Cameron Brannigan limped off, Marcus McGuane stepped up and more than played his part. I still couldn't allow myself to get carried away with the we are going up chart until deep, deep into stoppage time. But Bolton never really looked like scoring, and I actually feel a little bit sorry for their fans. It's a long way to come with the season on the line for your side not to show up. The final whistle blew and Oxford United were championship bound. It isn't supposed to be this comfortable. It isn't supposed to be this enjoyable. But it was. And it was real. The Death Star was destroyed and the Empire defeated. The Rebels could start their promotion party on the forest moon of Endor. This game will always be remembered as the Josh Murphy final. He deserves all the accolades. His performance made all the difference. But to a man, Oxford were exceptional. Apart from Jamie Cumming, the lazy git, he did nothing all game. Sam Long set the tone early with a crunching tackle on Paris Maghoma. Harris led the charge from the front. Dale... Goodrum, Rodriguez and Brannigan were brave in possession. Kieran Brown and Joe Bennett won every header and every challenge. And Elliot Moore put in a captain's performance and didn't put a foot wrong all game. Marcus McGuane filled Brannigan's shoes impeccably. And even Josh McEachran and Greg Lee added an element of stability and calm from the bench. As for Des Buckingham, well, this was his magnum opus. This was his masterclass. There was something quite often he talked about during the season was peaking at the right time. We kind of laughed those comments off during the bad times, but my goodness, he was true to his word. Oxford played their best game of the season when it mattered the most. We weren't lucky, we weren't hanging on, we were the better side, and we deserved promotion. So, as I said earlier, this game was as good as it ever has been for me supporting Oxford United. To do it at Wembley, is always the best way to get promotion, which puts it above 1996 and 2016. So that just leaves 2010. And whilst that was amazing too, I remember the torture, pain and anguish of the day as much as I enjoy the good times and quite frankly, the relief of the day as well. That game was about the survival of the football club and I was just nervous all day to the point where I was getting annoyed at casual Oxford fans singing songs on the coach on the way up. I think that says a lot about me, but I just couldn't allow myself to enjoy that day unless Oxford won. This victory in 2024 was so very different. I was delighted that we'd gotten to Wembley and didn't really feel any nerves until that second half when promotion came very real. But whilst there were nerves, I was thoroughly enjoying this Oxford United performance and proud of the Oxford United performance as well. A number of weeks later, I may still just be in a state of delirium after winning promotion, but there feels a real connection between the club and the fans at the moment. And it seems that more and more people want to be a part of it. The singing of Hey Jude at the end at Wembley is a genuine lump in the throat moment. The bus parade seemed far more electric than it did in 2010. Having a man from Oxford being the Oxford manager just seems to make the club more relatable. And there's other little things as well, like when me and my brother got back from Wembley, we were walking through Kidlington and cars were waving flags and honking their horns. Now, personally, I thought this was disgraceful and it shows why we should never build a stadium there. But I can't ever remember this happening before. And the only things that would have made the day better would be if my dad was still with us and if my other brother, who is still with us but lives abroad, could have been there too. But this for me was the most united I have ever seen Oxford United. So with Oxford in a strong position on and off the pitch, we can look forward to a year in the championship and hopefully longer. Who knows how much higher we can go, but it's taken 25 years for the club to recover from their financial problems to get back to this level. There have been some truly dark times during that 25 years, and you'll all have memories of this. And it's important to try and enjoy next season, regardless of times when it is going to be tough. 
The squad for next season is already taking shape and new signings are coming in. But I did also want to touch on Josh Murphy, who did not re-sign for the Yellows and instead chose life by the seaside in Portsmouth. I was a little disgruntled by this at the time, mainly because he chose Pompey. Now, it's not a slur against Pompey at all, but... I see them in a similar position to Oxford as a newly promoted club. In my silly mind, somehow it would have been more acceptable if he would have joined a Burnley or a Norwich like that somehow would have made it better. But you have to remember, and I know most of you do, that Murphy selected the best deal for him and his family and you can't really argue with that. It doesn't take away the memories he gave us and it doesn't take away that performance in the playoff final. Des Buckingham deserves the credit because he helped bring the best out of Murphy, but you've got to admire Josh Murphy's resolve this season. And I could even go back to the second half of a 2-0 defeat against Barnsley the season before because you saw a man that was determined to make a difference, even if that was in cameos coming off the bench or playing left-back in the EFL trophy. He made sure that you noticed him. It would have been wonderful if he stayed, but I know I would shake him by the hand and buy him half a shandy if I saw him in a boozer. And that is just about it. I hope you've enjoyed this trip through this remarkable season. Please, once again, tell me about your highs and your lows. I'm sure I have missed things out. Let me know about your favourite game other than Wembley and what you hope will happen for Oxford in the future. Anyone that's watched any of these videos deserves a bloody medal and thank you so much for doing it. It does mean a lot to me. I will once again ask that if you can hit the like button and if you can share this out to any friends or on social media, I will really appreciate that as well. As I draw a line under this season, I can already feel myself getting excited about reviewing Oxford United in the Championship. Come on, you yellows.